Next, I would like to talk about mathematical proofs. In principle, I want to talk about algorithms and the data structures. But as we've seen, to argue about the efficiency and to argue about the correctness of an algorithm, we actually need mathematical proofs. And therefore, my plan is to give you a quick overview of different techniques used in proofs. So very often when I talk about algorithms and data structures, I will not be giving a formal proof, but I will give some convincing argument. But in principle, all of these are mathematical proofs, and it's good to see how to formally write down such a proof. So what is a mathematical proof? It's a convincing argument for a reader that establishes the correctness of some, some mathematical statement. So either this statement is my algorithm is correct, or this statement is my algorithm runs in O of whatever, O of n time. Or it could be a very different statement, but these are the types of statements we're looking at here. So it should be convincing, there should be no doubt left, so that we afterwards really know that our algorithm is correct, that it is efficient. Proofs are a form of communication. So in particular, when I write a proof, I should be writing it for you, the reader. Or you should write it for me, the reader. In particular, proofs should be clearly written, so they should be easy to follow. I don't know what happens in your head while you're writing the proof. So all the steps should actually be there, and vice versa. You don't know what I'm thinking while writing the proof. So again, it's, it's a matter of writing for a reader. So every all the important steps should be there. It should also be kind of an, simply the argument. So it's very different from the process of proving. So if, if, if I think about why is this algorithm correct, then or how do I prove that the algorithm is correct? Then I will try maybe one loop invariant, refine it, try that new one, and so on. So that is a process with lots of details. But then at the end of that, I will write down a very clean proof. Hopefully. And you should be precise, which does not mean that you have to be overly formal, but you should be precise. So um, proofs should not be in any way ambiguous. And they should leave no, no doubt for the reader. So this is what is a proof. Some guidelines for writing proofs. And we'll see this in the proofs that I'm going to show you. We'll see these guidelines, mostly, sometimes for... Uh, to keep the proof shorter, I might be some elements might be missing. So, I've, but if you spot that, great. So, a proof should always start with saying, "Okay, it's a proof," and which technique I'm using. So, for instance, if I'm proving correctness using a loop invariant proof, I should state at the beginning that this will be a loop invariant proof. Try to use a linear flow. Yeah. So again, if if you're proving something then you're not necessarily thinking about the, the correctness in terms of a linear flow, but if you write about the correctness, use a linear flow. Every step should be clearly described in words. In particular, don't use overly complicated notation. So sometimes uh, people think or tend to try to be very formal and use, use complicated notation to, to be pre as precise as possible, but the effect can be that the reader has no clue what you're writing about or would have to look up so much notation and keep it in, in their head that it's not really readable and proofs should be readable. Make sure that whatever you assume is actually obvious. It's very common that if you feel as the writer of a proof the need to write obviously the following holds it's a sign for there is a step missing which you should really fill in. Because if it's that obvious, why not write this one sentence that explains why it's obvious? And then at the end, make sure to finish your proof. So you've done all the proof, you've, you've come to the final conclusion, then you should also say, okay, this proves the statement. So, and at the very end, you can place it's a small square, that's a symbol for that the proof is finished. So the reader knows that whatever comes after that is actually not part of the proof anymore. 
We'll be looking at the following proof techniques. So the first thing we are going to see is a direct proof, proof by contraposition and proof by contradiction. Those are very similar in terms of what they prove, but they all kind of prove it in different ways depending on what, what's easiest. Then two proofs, I should be careful about this statement, proof by example. I mean, very often proof by example is not a proof, but in certain cases as it is, and we'll see when that is the case. Case distinctions, which is maybe not a proof technique as as such, but often used as a technique within a proof. And then finally, we'll take a closer look at mathematical induction, kind of a regular mathematical induction, but also the concept of a strong induction. And another proof technique, which we already talked about, uh, loop invariant proofs. I just list them here. We're obviously not talking about them again. And there are more techniques, but these are enough for everything that we are planning to do. So those are the ones that I want to briefly show you. Let's start with a direct proof, which is kind of the most natural way of proving a statement, or in particular an implication. So if you have a statement of the form from P follows Q, so or if P then Q, then the, the most natural way of proving that is to assume that P is true, and then through manipulations end up with Q, or that Q is true. And then your proof is done. Let's take an example. We want to prove that if n is odd, an odd integer, then n squared is also an odd integer. So how do we prove this? We will have to use the definitions of what odd is. So in principle, you're let me kind of just draw the global structure before actually doing the proof. So we will write proof somewhere. Now in principle we state which technique we're using. I would say direct proof is, is a special case where you don't explicitly say that you're using a direct proof because it's kind of the, the, the natural proof to do. You will want to start with assume n is an odd integer. Then you're going to use, you you would have to use the definition of, of whatever, whatever odd means. And that's essentially then your starting point. Then there will be some kind of steps here that manipulate this term to to get to this statement here, where you again use essentially the definition of odd. And end up with n squared is odd. So that is kind of the structure that you have. And then you'll finish your proof. So what is the definition of an integer being odd? So an integer is either odd or even. And if it's even, it means that, so n is even if it can be written as 2k, where k is yet another integer. And an integer is odd if it can be written as 2k plus 1, where k is another integer. And any integer is either even or odd. So we're going to use this definition here. We know Therefore, know that n can be written as 2k plus 1. So let's do that. We have a proof. We assume n is odd. We write down what this means in terms of the definition. So we say n has the form 2k plus 1 for some integer k. We now do some manipulation. And the manipulation, quite naturally here, because we want to say something about n squared, is we take the square of n. So the square of n is now, because we know that n has this form, is a square of 2k plus 1, which is 2k squared plus 2 times 2k plus 1 squared, which we can rewrite as or 2 times 2k squared. This is 2 times 2k, so 2 times 2k, and then we have the 1 here, plus 1. Now if you look at this, if you define this here as k prime, then it again has a form 2 times k prime plus 1. So n squared can be written 
in the form 2 times k prime plus 1, where k prime is exactly this value here. And that concludes my proof. That was a direct proof. So we want to prove that P implies Q, and we do this by assuming P, doing some manipulations, ending up with Q. And very often at the beginning and end, we will have to use some definitions to kind of go from the statement P to, to some kind of mathematical statement, and also at the end. And that's a direct proof. Next, let's do a proof by contraposition. And contraposition is the following. So again, we have a statement P implies Q. Instead of starting with P and manipulating until we end up with Q, we will make use of the following. The statement P implies Q is equivalent to the statement not Q implies not P. And again, why is that the case? I mean, assume, assume P implies Q is true, then if we have not Q, then that cannot imply P, because then we would get P, but also not Q. But I mean, you can do this more formally. We don't want to do that here. But this statement, not Q implies not P, is equivalent to P implies Q. Knowing this, if we want to prove that P implies Q, we can prove this by using the contraposition and essentially a direct proof on the contraposition or contrapositive, meaning we start off with assuming that Q does not hold and we derive that P does not hold. And that's it. So let's look at this by an example. And the example that we have here is for an integer n, if 3n plus 2 is odd, then n is odd. Now you could use a direct proof here, but it's a bit annoying because you start with a somewhat complicated term and you want to derive a somewhat simpler term. It's actually easier to use contraposition. So what does that mean here? It means I have this statement, which is P, this statement that is Q, and now I want to use not Q implies not P. So what does that mean? It means that I want to prove that if n is not odd, then 3n plus 2 is not odd. If I prove this, I've proven my original statement. Okay, and not odd is the same as even, same here. So stated differently, what I now want to prove is if n is even, then 3n plus 2 is even. And this is now a very easy direct proof. That was proof by contraposition. We've already seen an example of this, or seen an example of the use of contraposition when we were doing loop invariant proof. So you don't have to read all of this here now. You just want to go look back at what we were doing here. So this was a better linear search. The termination condition we wanted to make use of this if statement here, if then, and using it directly, I mean, it would also have been possible, but it was much easier to use the contraposition. So instead of using the statement P implies Q, we used not Q implies not P. And in that way, not P was here the conclusion that X is not in A, and therefore returning not found was the right thing to do. So much about contraposition. Let's have a small quiz. What is the contraposition or the contrapositive of the following statement? If n squared is even, then n is even. So is it a, if n squared is odd, then n is odd, b, if n is odd, then n squared is odd, or is it c, if n is even, then n squared is even, or None of these. None of A, B, or C. The correct answer is B. If N is odd, then N squared is odd. Yeah, so we're going from this is Q, N is even. We're doing not Q, 
So n is not even, which is n is odd here, to not p, which is n squared is odd. And this is also a very nice example where um, the contra position is much easier to prove because if you start with n squared is even and want to show that n is even, then you start with n squared, you will want to take a square root, you will have some kind of square root of 2 and it's a bit of a mess. But if n is odd, then n squared is odd, it's very simple to prove, we've already done so by a direct proof. The next proof technique is proof by contradiction. It's a very nice and actually simple proof technique. Maybe the first time you use it, it's a bit counterintuitive, but it's actually also very intuitive. So what, what, what is proof by contradiction? You want to prove a statement, but instead of proving that statement directly, what you do is you assume that the opposite is true. Then do manipulations until you end up with utter nonsense or at least something that contradicts what you initially assumed. And then you know that the negation of your statement is false, meaning that your original statement was true. And I'm citing Sherlock Holmes here. I mean, just imagine as an example, somebody claims that they were at three o'clock somewhere, but they were seen 10 minutes later somewhere else and from a, getting from A to B takes 20 minutes, then we know that the original claim was wrong. So we want to prove some statement Q, but what we do instead, we assume not Q and we end up with a contradiction. And this is useful when the, when the negation is, is simpler to work with. An example where you saw this was for in the algorithm efficiency. Namely, when we wanted to prove that this term here, so some cubic function, is not in theta of n squared. So how did we prove that? We proved it by assuming that it is in this class. So we are assuming that this function here has a growth rate of n squared. And having a growth rate of n squared means, by the definitions, that we were able to find these constants such that essentially we can bound this cubic function by a quadratic function and from that, by essentially dividing by n squared on both sides, we got that 19n is smaller than a constant, 19n goes to infinity, so we have a contradiction where we also use this arrow, at least on the slides, to denote the contradiction. In your written proof, it's enough if you write them. It's a contradiction. And this is also my example for contradiction, to keep things short. Some steps to take into account um, when writing a proof by contradiction. Of course, as always, start with stating your proof technique. So state that you're using a proof by contradiction. Specify what your assumption is, which should be the negation of the original claim. Derive a statement that contradicts your assumption, or in another way is clearly a false statement. And then wrap up the proof by pointing out the contradiction and therefore concluding that your original statement was true. As a quiz, one more example, and this is the example that we've already seen previously. So if we want to prove if n squared is even, then n is even, but now we want to prove it by contradiction. And what we're going to do is we will assume that n squared is even. So that is an assumption that we make, and now we should be proving that n is even. If we prove this by contradiction, what else do we assume? n squared is odd, n is odd, n is even. We're going to assume that n is odd. Yeah, so we take the what we actually want to prove. We want to prove that n is even, under the assumption that n squared is even. We want to prove that n is even, 
But instead of proving this directly, we're going to assume that n is odd. And we're going to lead this to a contradiction. And actually in this case, um, we already know that if n is odd, then actually n squared is odd. So n squared is odd contradicts the assumption that n squared is even, because n squared cannot be even and odd at the same time. So we have our contradiction. Contradiction. And the proof is done. Let's move on. Proof by example. So very commonly, proof by example is not really a proof. But there is a situation where proof by example is a valid proof, and that is if the statement that we want to prove has an existential quantifier. Existential quantifier means it starts with something like there is something. There is an integer x such that x is smaller than 100. Okay, a very trivial statement. It's just an example here. But this statement can be proven by example. So I can just say, okay, if I pick x is 10, x is an integer, 10 is smaller than 100, so my statement is true. That is proof by example. This example that I give here is actually, I mean, somewhat stupid. But you've seen a proof by example previously, namely when we are proving algorithm efficiency. And that was this one here. Again, I don't want to go into detail because we've seen this already. I just put, put this proof once more on the slide. Here we wanted to prove that n, this cubic function is in, has cubic growth rate. And in principle, from, in terms of the global structure, we have, I would see this as a direct proof. So we have, let's say, t of n, we say, if t of n looks like this, like this, then t of n is in this class of functions. But in this direct proof, we are making use of a proof by example. Namely, this class here, theta, is defined in terms of an existential quantifier. There exists positive constants c1, c2, and c0. Therefore, if I can give examples of c1, c2, and n0, such that the statement holds, I'm fine. This is exactly what happens here. I pick numbers, prove that those numbers work out, so that's happening here, and then I'm done. Proof by example. You should not use a proof by example if you don't have an existential quantifier. In particular, if you have a universal quantifier, meaning you have a for all statement, like for, for all positive x, 2x is smaller than 256, obviously a completely wrong statement, giving, a, giving one example certainly does not prove this. So you cannot, cannot use an example for a universal code file. Next technique, case analysis. So case analysis commonly is used if you have a universal quantifier, so you have a for all statement. Um, and you can break it into several cases. So a common situation is you want to prove something for all integers, and maybe you need a different proof for even integers and for odd integers. A different setting where we use case distinction is if you are analyzing an algorithm and that algorithm uses an if statement. Then very often your correctness proof will need a case distinction depending on whether that if statement evaluated to true or whether it evaluated to false. And we've seen an example of this, and that was a loop invariant proof for linear search. And there we had two cases which came from the if statement. So proofs can use case distinctions. When you use a case distinction, make sure to clearly point out that you're using a case distinction. Make every case clear, so it should be clear which part belongs to which case. For each case, prove whatever you wanted to prove and then bring that together. So with this case distinction, I've covered all possible cases. So you have to prove, also make sure that one of the cases applies. And therefore my statement is true. So now we've seen various proof techniques. One 
that is important for this course is proof by induction. So, so far in this course, we haven't seen proofs by induction. I mean, to some extent, a loop invariant proof is a proof by induction in disguise. But at the latest, when we prove correctness and when we analyze the running time of so-called recursive algorithms that we're going to see, not today, but later in the course, then we need proof by induction. So what is the idea of proof by induction? So imagine you have these dominoes, and I tip over the first one. What can you say about this domino here? I mean, assuming that the dominoes nicely continue here, you can say that this domino will fall over. And why is that the case? It's the case because if a domino falls, the next domino falls, and also because I was tipping over the first one. And that is kind of an inductive um, setting. So the idea is that we have a statement prioritized by, by some number. So we have a statement about, for instance, all integers. So then it's a statement about one, a statement about two, a statement about three, or a statement about all natural numbers, actually, I should say. And the way induction works is it, it proves the statement for the f for one, so for the first number. Then it proves that given that it holds for one number, it holds for the next number. And in that way, we can prove it for all numbers. Yeah, so we have the base case where we prove it for the first number. And then we need the step which says if it holds for a certain number, then it also holds for the next number. And in this way, we can prove it for all numbers. And uh, induction, so it has a base case, it has a step, and very important here is this induction hypothesis. So you have a statement that you want to prove for all n, and you first prove it for 1, and then you prove if the induction hypothesis holds for n, then it also holds for n plus 1. So when do we use inductions? Whenever we want to prove something for all n, for all natural numbers, or for starting at some number. So we don't have to start with 1, we can start with a different one, with a different number. Um, so this is a case where we cannot, so if we would prove it for each number separately, then we would have an infinite number of cases. But in this way, we can prove it for all numbers at the same time. So in our domino setting, I mean, that's not really a mathematical proof. Let's let, let's kind of take it to, to analyze the structure. So let's say the theorem would be, if I have n dominoes and um, I push over the first one, then they all fall. We would write, if we write a proof, we would first state the technique. So we would first say, okay, we do a proof by induction. We then have the base case, so if n is 1, so if I only have one domino, and I tip over the first one, I mean, then all, because I only have one domino, all dominoes fall. Then we have states the induction hypothesis. So the induction hypothesis is if we have n dominoes in a row and I push over the first one, they all fall. And now I'm assuming the induction hypothesis for n and need to prove it for n plus 1. So I assume the, so this stands short for induction hypothesis holds for n dominoes. So if I have n plus 1 dominoes, it means that the first n form a row of length n. So I know that for the first n dominoes, if I push over the first one, all of the first n dominoes fall. But then it in particular means that the nth domino falls, and that one will push over the n plus first. Which means that the induction hypothesis holds again for now for n plus 1 dominoes. For the step it's important, it's, it's useful to kind of state, okay, we're going from n to n plus 1. Let's take an example. We want to prove that for all positive integers n, 3 to the n minus 1 is even. We do a proof by induction. So the base case is n is 1. So if n is 1, I plug in 1. I get 3 to the 1 minus 1 is simply 2. 2 is even. We are fine. Now the induction hypothesis states 3n minus 1 is even, 
I'm assuming it holds for n. I now want to show that it holds for n plus 1. So I assume it's true for, for I, I assume that half 3 to the n minus 1 is even. And I now want to show that 3 to the n plus 1 minus 1 is even. And very often in these induction proofs you see some kind of substitution happening. So I first change what I have here. So I change this term so that I can write it in terms of the previous one. And then I can make use of the fact that the previous one was even. So here that would look like follow as follows. So 3 to the n plus 1 is 3 times 3 to the n. So 3 to the n plus 1 minus 1 is 3 times 3 to the n minus 1. I can take this. It's 3 times something. So I can write it as 3 to the n plus 3 to the n plus 3 to the n. Or simply 2 times 3 to the n plus 3 to the n. And that is what's happening here. 2 times 3 to the n. And one more 3 to the n. Which I conveniently place together with a minus 1. Because what we have now here is that because there's a 2... 2 times the number, 2 times k is even, so this is even. Now, by induction hypothesis, by induction hypothesis, this is even. The first number is even, the second number is even, the sum of two even numbers is even, meaning 3 to the n plus 1 minus 1 is even. The induction hypothesis therefore holds for n plus 1, this is what we wanted to prove. Because now we can, can conclude that indeed 3 to the n minus 1 is even for all n larger or equal 1. So here are some steps for your induction proofs. Make sure that you state that you're using induction and what the variable is. So in our case n, or in these cases n, you need a base case, I need to prove the base case, you need to state your induction hypothesis and then prove the induction step where you go from the induction hypothesis for let's say n to n plus 1 or whatever your variable was. When you do your step, clearly indicate where you're using the induction hypothesis. I mean, if your induction step would not be using the induction hypothesis, it wouldn't really be an induction. So something is wrong with your proof. Therefore, make sure, so the application of the induction hypothesis in the step is important. And when you write down your proof, make sure to make clear where that actually happens. Here's a checklist for induction. The argument for the step, as I just already said, should use the induction hypothesis. If not, something's wrong with your proof. Either it's not an induction or it's incomplete. Or it's simply at least incompletely written down because you didn't state where the induction hypothesis was used. A pitfall can be that you have cases that rely on unproven base cases. We'll see an example in a moment. You should make sure, so in induction, you always should be going from n to n plus 1 or whatever your variable is. You should not, so from something smaller to something bigger, because otherwise you can kind of end up in some kind of weird loop shouldn't it really be your problem. Then, very often the induction hypothesis is essentially the same as what you actually want to prove, just that you want to prove it for all n. But otherwise, if that's not quite the case, if the, if the induction hypothesis was just kind of a tool towards proving something, then you should obviously conclude whatever you wanted to conclude from the induction hypothesis. And always argue in the step from n to n plus 1 or whatever you call your variable. Here's a quiz. What's wrong with the following proof? So which st step is wrong? Is there, is there a mistake in the base case? Is there a, a mistake in how I phrase the induction hypothesis? Or is there a mistake in the induction step? Somewhere there has to be a mistake because my claim is obviously nonsense. So what it states is that in every set of n horses, all horses have the same color. So read the proof and then decide what part is wrong. The mistake here is in the induction step. 
And there's a following issue. So I'm stating here, so I have n plus 1 horses, and now I'm stating, okay, I can use induction hypothesis to conclude that the first n all have the same color. I'm using it so, such that the last n have the same color. All of that I can uh, I get from the induction hypothesis. And then clearly, I mean, since this horse here can only have one color, everyone here has the same color as that horse. The mistake that happened to us here is the following. If n is 1, the drawing that I just made looks like this. This is n plus 2, n plus 1, which is 2. This is n, and this is n. n is 1, n is 1. This horse, which supposedly lives in the overlap, actually doesn't exist. So this step implicitly assumed that n was actually larger than 1. And that was our mistake. So the way to fix this in principle would be to say, okay, if the step assumes that n is larger than 1, I should handle the case n is 2 also in the base case. But obviously n is 2, I won't be able to prove that two horses always have the same color. And this is our example of where you have to be careful about that you don't have missing base cases. So much about regular induction and the induction that you see most often. For this course, very important is also strong induction. The idea of strong induction is very similar to regular induction. So regular induction, we had the base case, P of 1. And then the step which went from n to n plus 1. We make now more information and more use of the information that we have. Namely, we again have the base case, P1. But then when we're going to prove Pn plus 1, we will use that P, we will assume that P, we know that P is true for not only P of n, but for all of the smaller or whatever you want to call them. This makes perfect sense, as in, if you think about how the induction works, so I make sure that the first one, it holds for 1, and then I can go from 1 to 2, from 2 to 3, from 3 to 4, and so on, that's regular. But of course I can just as well say, make sure, okay, the, it holds for the first one, so from that I go to the second one, from the first two I go to the third one, and again I can prove that it's true for all n. Here's an example. We want to prove that if I have 2 and 5 cent coins, then I can get any amount uh, larger equal 4. We're going to use strong induction. The base case will be... And now we have to be careful. So the natural base case would be n is 4. Let's try that. If n is 4, Okay, I can make sure that it's, it holds because I can use two, two cent coins to get four. In the induction hypothesis, the induction hypothesis will be now that we can make any amount, i, using two and five cent coins for all values up to n, starting at four. Because we were proving the statement starting at four. Now, assuming this, that is true up to n, we want to show that it also holds for n plus 1. If I take n plus 1, let's say the last coin that I use is a 2 cent coin. Then I'm at n minus 1. Now n minus 1 is smaller equal n. So I, imply, I apply the induction hypothesis to sh say n minus 1 I can pay with 2 and 5 euro coins. Now there's a slight issue here, and the slight issue is that when n is 4 and n plus 1 is 5, then n minus 1 is 3. 
So I can only apply the induction hypothesis if n minus 1 is actually larger or equal to 4. How can I fix this? I can fix this by using the step only for n larger or equal to 5. Because if I'm using it for n larger or equal to 5, then n minus 1 is 4, I'm fine. If I want to use this step only starting at 5, I will also need to... And starting at 5 means going from smaller equal 5 to 6. I will have to put 5 also into the base case. So I have to take as base case n equals 4 and n equals 5. Now this is easier if we have, I mean, if, if n is 5, I can simply use one 5 cent coin. But then my proof would kind of change by, I have two base cases, n is 4, n is 5. In both cases, I see that I can handle it either by two, two cent coins or one 5 cent coin. And then the induction hypothesis and the step is just as before. So let's compare the two types of inductions that we had. We had regular induction or what we most commonly simply call induction, uh, the strong induction. We start, we will make a statement for all x larger or equal a or all n larger or equal something or an a very often is simply 1. The base case then at least is this case but sometimes more as we just saw. So sometimes we need to have several base cases. That is can be in the regular induction of the case, in the strong induction just as well. Then the induction hypothesis here simply say, okay, let's assume it holds for n. And here it is, let's assume it holds for all values small a equal n. And at least a if I'm starting at some a. It's a step I want to go from that to n plus 1. That is true in both of the inductions. A uh, regular induction, if it applies, it's kind of the simpler option. The strong induction we always want to use if to go to n plus 1 we might be doing a big step, not just a step of 1. So in the in the coin setting we were making a step of, um, for instance, 2. Okay, let's recap what we've seen today. We've seen loop invariant proofs, which we use to prove correctness of algorithms that have loops. We had initialization, maintenance, termination. As examples, we saw better linear search, better linear search again, and linear search. Then I showed you a couple of proof techniques on how to write down proofs. In particular, direct proof contraposition, contradiction, proof by example, case analysis, and then inductions, regular and strong inductions. And so far, we haven't really seen why strong inductions are so important for us. But we will very soon talk about recursive algorithms. And as soon as we talk about recursive algorithms, we will need strong induction. Let me finish by giving you a small puzzle. And this puzzle is a puzzle about induction. So the answer to this puzzle uses induction. So what is this puzzle? So you have two people here called Jip and Janneke. They both have a number on their forehead, which is, they don't see their number, they see the number of the other person. It's natural numbers, so 1, 2, 3, whatever. In this example, 15 and 16, so it's consecutive numbers. So in particular, if I see a 16, I already know 15 or 17. Now, the game works as follows. One of them starts. Who starts? Janneke starts. If Janneke knows her number, she says, I know my number. If she doesn't know her number, she says, mm, I don't know my number. Then Yip continues and either says, I know my number, or says, I don't know my number. And they go back and forth. The question is, does this game ever end? That's all for today. See you next time.